Chapter 40 Balaam This chapter is based on Numbers 22 and 24. Returning to the Jordan from the conquest of Bashan, the Israelites, in preparation for the immediate invasion of Canaan, encamped beside the river, above its entrance into the Dead Sea, and just opposite the plain of Jericho. They were upon the very borders of Moab, and the Moabites were filled with terror at the close proximity of the invaders. The people of Moab had not been molested by Israel, yet they had watched with troubled forebodings all that had taken place in the surrounding countries. The Amorites, before whom they had been forced to retreat, had been conquered by the Hebrews, and the territory which the Amorites had wrested from Moab was now in the possession of Israel. The hosts of Bashan had yielded before the mysterious power enshrouded in the cloudy pillar, and the giant strongholds were occupied by the Hebrews. The Moabites dared not risk an attack upon them. An appeal to arms was hopeless in face of the supernatural agencies that wrought in their behalf. But they determined, as Pharaoh had done, to enlist the power of sorcery to counteract the work of God. They would bring a curse upon Israel. The people of Moab were closely connected with the Midianites, both by the ties of nationality and religion. And Balak, the king of Moab, aroused the fears of the kindred people, and secured their cooperation in his designs against Israel by the message, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. Balaam, an inhabitant of Mesopotamia, was reported to possess supernatural powers, and his fame had reached to the land of Moab. It was determined to call him to their aid. Accordingly, messengers of the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian were sent to secure his divinations and enchantments against Israel. The ambassadors at once set out on their long journey over the mountains and across the desert to Mesopotamia. And upon finding Balaam, they delivered to him the message of their king, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. Balaam was once a good man, and a prophet of God, but he had apostatized and had given himself up to covetousness. Yet he still professed to be a servant of the Most High. He was not ignorant of God's work in behalf of Israel. And when the messengers announced their errand, he well knew that it was his duty to refuse the rewards of Balak and to dismiss the ambassadors. But he ventured to dally with temptation and urged the messengers to tarry with him that night, declaring that he could give no decided answer till he had asked counsel of the Lord. Balaam knew that his curse could not harm Israel. God was on their side, and so long as they were true to him, no adverse power of earth or hell could prevail against them. But his pride was flattered by the words of the ambassadors, He whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. The bribe of costly gifts and prospect of exaltation excited his covetousness. He greedily accepted the offered treasures, and then, while professing strict obedience to the will of God, he tried to comply with the desires of Balak. In the night season the angel of God came to Balaam with the message, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. In the morning, Balaam reluctantly dismissed the messengers. But he did not tell them what the Lord had said. Angry that his visions of gain and honor had been suddenly dispelled, he petulantly exclaimed, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuses to give me leave to go with you. Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. The sin of covetousness, which God declares to be idolatry, had made him a time-server, 
and through this one fault Satan gained entire control of him. It was this that caused his ruin. The tempter is ever presenting worldly gain and honor to entice men from the service of God. He tells them it is their over-conscientiousness that keeps them from prosperity. Thus many are induced to venture out of the path of strict integrity. One wrong step makes the next easier, and they become more and more presumptuous. They will do and dare most terrible things when once they have given themselves to the control of avarice and a desire for power. Many flatter themselves that they can depart from strict integrity for a time for the sake of some worldly advantage, and that having gained their object, they can change their course when they please. Such are entangling themselves in the snare of Satan, and it is seldom that they escape. When the messengers reported to Balak the prophet's refusal to accompany them, they did not intimate that God had forbidden him. Supposing that Balaam's delay was merely to secure a richer reward, the king sent princes more in number and more honorable than the first, with promises of higher honors, and with authority to concede to any terms that Balaam might demand. Balak's urgent message to the prophet was, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, for I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. A second time Balaam was tested. In response to the solicitations of the ambassadors, he professed great conscientiousness and integrity, assuring them that no amount of gold and silver could induce him to go contrary to the will of God. But he longed to comply with the king's request, and although the will of God had already been definitely made known to him, he urged the messengers to tarry that he might further inquire of God, as though the Infinite One were a man to be persuaded. In the night season the Lord appeared to Balaam and said, if the men come to call thee, rise up, and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. Thus far the Lord would permit Balaam to follow his own will, because he was determined upon it. He did not seek to do the will of God, but chose his own course, and then endeavored to secure the sanction of the Lord. There are thousands at the present day who are pursuing a similar course. They would have no difficulty in understanding their duty if it were in harmony with their inclinations. It is plainly set before them in the Bible or is clearly indicated by circumstances and reason. But because these evidences are contrary to their desires and inclinations, they frequently set them aside and presume to go to God to learn their duty. With great apparent conscientiousness, they pray long and earnestly for light but God will not be trifled with. He often permits such persons to follow their own desires and to suffer the result. My people would not hearken to my voice, so I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Psalm 81, verses 11 and 12. When one clearly sees a duty, let him not presume to go to God with the prayer that he may be excused from performing it, he should, rather, with a humble, submissive spirit, ask for divine strength and wisdom to meet its claims. The Moabites were a degraded, idolatrous people, yet, according to the light which they had received, their guilt was not so great in the sight of heaven as was that of Balaam. As he professed to be God's prophet, however, all he should say would be supposed to be uttered by divine authority. Hence he was not to be permitted to speak as he chose, but must deliver the message which God should give him. The word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do, was the divine command. Balaam had received permission to go with the messengers from Moab if they came in the morning to call him. But, annoyed at his delay and expecting another refusal, they set out on their homeward journey without further consultation with him. Every excuse for complying with the request of Balak had now been removed. But Balaam was determined to secure the reward, and taking the beast upon which he was accustomed to ride, he set out on the journey. 
He feared that even now the divine permission might be withdrawn, and he pressed eagerly forward, impatient lest he should by some means fail to gain the coveted reward. But the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. The animal saw the divine messenger, who was unperceived by the man, and turned aside from the highway into a field. With cruel blows Balaam brought the beast back into the path, but again, in a narrower place shut in by walls, the angel appeared, and the animal, trying to avoid the menacing figure, crushed his master's foot against the wall. Balaam was blinded to the heavenly interposition, and knew not that God was obstructing his path. The man became exasperated, and beating the ass unmercifully, forced it to proceed. Again, in a narrow place, where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left, the angel appeared as before in a threatening attitude, and the poor beast, trembling with terror, made a full stop, and fell to the earth under its rider. Balaam's rage was unbounded, and with his staff he smote the animal more cruelly than before. God now opened its mouth, and by the dumb ass speaking with man's voice, he forbade the madness of the prophet. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 16. What have I done unto thee, it said, that thou hast smitten me these three times? Furious at being thus hindered in his journey, Balaam answered the beast, as he would have addressed an intelligent being, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. Here was a professed magician, on his way to pronounce a curse upon a whole people with the intent to paralyze their strength while he had not power even to slay the animal upon which he rode. The eyes of Balaam were now opened, and he beheld the angel of God standing with drawn sword ready to slay him. In terror he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. The angel said to him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me, and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee, and saved her alive. Balaam owed the preservation of his life to the poor animal that he had treated so cruelly. The man who claimed to be a prophet of the Lord, who declared that his eyes were open, and he saw the vision of the Almighty, was so blinded by covetousness and ambition that he could not discern the angel of God visible to his beast. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. How many are thus blinded! They rush on in forbidden paths, transgressing the divine law, and cannot discern that God and his angels are against them. Like Balaam, they are angry at those who would prevent their ruin. Balaam had given evidence of the spirit that controlled him by his treatment of his beast. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10. Few realize, as they should, the sinfulness of abusing animals or leaving them to suffer from neglect. He who created man made the lower animals also, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Psalm 145, verse 9. The animals were created to serve man, but he has no right to cause them pain by harsh treatment or cruel exaction. It is because of man's sin that the whole creation groaneth and traveleth in pain together. Romans chapter 8, verse 22. Suffering and death were thus entailed, not only upon the human race, but upon the animals. Surely, then, it becomes man to seek to lighten, instead of increasing the weight of suffering which his transgression has brought upon God's creatures. He who will abuse animals because he has them in his power is both a coward and a tyrant. A disposition to cause pain, whether to our fellow men or to the brute creation, is satanic. 
Many do not realize that their cruelty will ever be known, because the poor dumb animals cannot reveal it. But could the eyes of these men be opened, as were those of Balaam, they would see an angel of God standing as a witness to testify against them in the courts above. A record goes up to heaven, and a day is coming when judgment will be pronounced against those who abuse God's creatures. When he beheld a messenger of God, Balaam exclaimed in terror, I have sinned, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displease thee, I will get me back again. The Lord suffered him to proceed on his journey, but gave him to understand that his words should be controlled by divine power. God would give evidence to Moab that the Hebrews were under the guardianship of heaven, and this he did effectually when he showed them how powerless Balaam was even to utter a curse against them without divine permission. The king of Moab, being informed of the approach of Balaam, went out with a large retinue to the borders of his kingdom to receive him. When he expressed his astonishment at Balaam's delay, in view of the rich rewards awaiting him, the prophet's answer was, Lo, I am come unto thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God putteth in my mouth, that shall I speak. Balaam greatly regretted this restriction. He feared that his purpose could not be carried out, because the Lord's controlling power was upon him. With great pomp, the king with the chief dignitaries of his kingdom escorted Balaam to the high places of Baal, from which he could survey the Hebrew hosts. Behold the prophet as he stands upon the lofty height, looking down over the encampment of God's chosen people. How little do the Israelites know of what is taking place so near them! How little do they know of the care of God, extended over them by day and by night! How dull are the perceptions of God's people! How slow are they, in every age, to comprehend His great love and mercy! If they could discern the wonderful power of God constantly exerted in their behalf, would not their hearts be filled with gratitude for His love, and with awe at the thought of His majesty and power? Balaam had some knowledge of the sacrificial offerings of the Hebrews, and he hoped that by surpassing them in costly gifts he might secure the blessing of God and ensure the accomplishment of his sinful projects. Thus the sentiments of the idolatrous Moabites were gaining control of his mind. His wisdom had become foolishness, his spiritual vision was beclouded, and he had brought blindness upon himself by yielding to the power of Satan. By Balaam's direction seven altars were erected, and he offered a sacrifice upon each. He then withdrew to a high place to meet with God, promising to make known to Balak whatever the Lord should reveal. With the nobles and princes of Moab the king stood beside the sacrifice, while around them gathered the eager multitude watching for the return of the prophet. He came at last, and the people waited for the words that should paralyze forever that strange power exerted in behalf of the hated Israelites. Balaam said, The king of Moab hath brought me from Aram, out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come, defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. Balaam confessed that he came with the purpose of cursing Israel, but the words he uttered were directly contrary to the sentiments of his heart. He was constrained to pronounce blessings, while his soul was filled with curses. As Balaam looked upon the encampment of Israel, he beheld with astonishment the evidence of their prosperity. They had been represented to him as a rude, disorganized multitude, infesting the country in roving bands that were a pest and terror to the surrounding nations. 
but their appearance was the reverse of all this. He saw the vast extent and perfect arrangement of their camp, everything bearing the marks of thorough discipline and order. He was shown the favor with which God regarded Israel and their distinctive character as his chosen people. They were not to stand upon a level with other nations, but to be exalted above them all. The people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. At the time when these words were spoken, the Israelites had no permanent settlement, and their peculiar character, their manners and customs were not familiar to Balaam. But how strikingly was this prophecy fulfilled in the after-history of Israel? Through all the years of their captivity, through all the ages since they were dispersed among the nations, they have remained a distinct people. So the people of God, the true Israel, though scattered throughout all nations, are on earth but sojourners, whose citizenship is in heaven. Not only was Balaam shown the history of the Hebrew people as a nation, but he beheld the increase and prosperity of the true Israel of God to the close of time. He saw the special favor of the Most High attending those who love and fear Him. He saw them supported by His arm as they enter the dark valley of the shadow of death. And He beheld them coming forth from their graves, crowned with glory, honor, and immortality. He saw the redeemed rejoicing in the unfading glories of the earth made new. Gazing upon the scene, He exclaimed, who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? And as he saw the crown of glory on every brow, the joy beaming from every countenance, and looked forward to that endless life of unalloyed happiness, he uttered the solemn prayer, Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. If Balaam had had a disposition to accept the light that God had given, he would now have made true his words. He would at once have severed all connection with Moab. He would no longer have presumed upon the mercy of God, but would have returned to him with deep repentance. But Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness, and these he was determined to secure. Balak had confidently expected a curse that would fall like a withering blight upon Israel, and at the words of the prophet he passionately exclaimed, What hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse thine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. Balaam, seeking to make a virtue of necessity, professed to have spoken from a conscientious regard for the will of God the words that had been forced from his lips by divine power. His answer was, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? Balak could not even now relinquish his purpose. He decided that the imposing spectacle presented by the vast encampment of the Hebrews had so intimidated Balaam that he dared not practice his divinations against them. The king determined to take the prophet to some point where only a small part of the host might be seen. If Balaam could be induced to curse them in detached parties, the whole camp would soon be devoted to destruction. On the top of an elevation called Pisgah, another trial was made. Again, seven altars were erected, whereon were placed the same offerings as at the first. The king and his princes remained by the sacrifices, while Balaam retired to meet with God. Again the prophet was entrusted with a divine message, which he was powerless to alter or withhold. When he appeared to the anxious, expectant company, the question was put to him, What hath the Lord spoken? The answer, as before, struck terror to the heart of the king and princes. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Awed by these revelations, Balaam exclaimed, Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. 
the great magician had tried his power of enchantment in accordance with the desire of the Moabites. But concerning this very occasion it should be said of Israel, What hath God wrought? While they were under the divine protection, no people or nation, though aided by all the power of Satan, should be able to prevail against them. All the world should wonder at the marvelous work of God in behalf of His people, that a man determined to pursue a sinful course should be so controlled by divine power as to utter instead of imprecations the richest and most precious promises in the language of sublime and impassioned poetry. And the favor of God at this time manifested toward Israel was to be an assurance of His protecting care for His obedient, faithful children in all ages. When Satan should inspire evil men to misrepresent, harass, and destroy God's people, this very occurrence would be brought to their remembrance and would strengthen their courage and their faith in God. The king of Moab, disheartened and distressed, exclaimed, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. Yet a faint hope still lingered in his heart, and he determined to make another trial. He now conducted Balaam to Mount Peor, where was a temple devoted to the licentious worship of Baal, their god. Here the same number of altars were erected as before, and the same number of sacrifices were offered. But Balaam went not alone, as at other times, to learn God's will. He made no pretense of sorcery, but standing beside the altars he looked abroad upon the tents of Israel. Again the Spirit of God rested upon him, and the divine message came from his lips, How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel! As the valleys are they spread forth, as gardens by the river's side, as the trees of Linalos, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. And his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion. Who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. The prosperity of God's people is here represented by some of the most beautiful figures to be found in nature. The prophet likens Israel to fertile valleys covered with abundant harvests, to flourishing gardens watered by never-failing springs, to the fragrant sandal tree and the stately cedar. The figure last mentioned is one of the most strikingly beautiful and appropriate to be found in the inspired word. The cedar of Lebanon was honored by all the people of the East. The class of trees to which it belongs is found wherever man has gone throughout the earth. From the Arctic regions to the tropic zone they flourish, rejoicing in the heat, yet braving the cold, springing in rich luxuriance by the riverside, yet towering aloft upon the parched and thirsty waste. They plant their roots deep among the rocks of the mountains and boldly stand in defiance of the tempest. Their leaves are fresh and green when all else has perished at the breath of winter. Above all other trees, the cedar of Lebanon is distinguished for its strength, its firmness, its undecaying vigor, and this is used as a symbol of those whose life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. Says the Scripture, The righteous shall grow like a cedar. Psalm 92, verse 12. The divine hand has exalted the cedar as king over the forest. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches. Ezekiel chapter 31, verse 8. Nor any tree in the garden of God. The cedar is repeatedly employed as an emblem of royalty, and its use in Scripture to represent the righteous shows how heaven regards those who do the will of God. Balaam prophesied that Israel's king would be greater and more powerful than Agag. This was the name given to the kings of the Amalekites, who were at this time a very powerful nation. But Israel, if true to God, would subdue all her enemies. The king of Israel was the Son of God, and his throne was one day to be established in the earth, 
and his power to be exalted above all earthly kingdoms. As he listened to the prophet's words, Balak was overwhelmed with disappointed hope, with fear and rage. He was indignant that Balaam could have given him the least encouragement of a favorable response when everything was determined against him. He regarded with scorn the prophet's compromising, deceptive course. The king exclaimed fiercely, Therefore now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. The answer was that the king had been forewarned that Balaam could speak only the message given him from God. Before returning to his people, Balaam uttered a most beautiful and sublime prophecy of the world's Redeemer and the final destruction of the enemies of God. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. And he closed by predicting the complete destruction of Moab and Edom, of Amalek and the Kenites, thus leaving to the Moabitish king no ray of hope. Disappointed in his hopes of wealth and promotion, in disfavor with the king, and conscious that he had incurred the displeasure of God, Balaam returned from his self-chosen mission. After he had reached his home, the controlling power of the Spirit of God left him, and his covetousness, which had been merely held in check, prevailed. He was ready to resort to any means to gain the reward promised by Balak. Balaam knew that the prosperity of Israel depended upon their obedience to God, and that there was no way to cause their overthrow but by seducing them into sin. He now decided to secure Balak's favor by advising the Moabites of the course to be pursued to bring a curse upon Israel. He immediately returned to the land of Moab and laid his plans before the king. The Moabites themselves were convinced that so long as Israel remained true to God, he would be their shield. The plan proposed by Balaam was to separate them from God by enticing them into idolatry. If they could be led to engage in the licentious worship of Baal and Ashtoreth, their omnipotent protector would become their enemy, and they would soon fall a prey to the fierce warlike nations around them. This plan was readily accepted by the king, and Balaam himself remained to assist in carrying it into effect. Balaam witnessed the success of his diabolical scheme. He saw the curse of God visited upon his people, and thousands falling under his judgments. But the divine justice that punished sin in Israel did not permit the tempters to escape. In the war of Israel against the Midianites, Balaam was slain. He had felt a presentiment that his own end was near when he exclaimed, Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his but he had not chosen to live the life of the righteous, and his destiny was fixed with the enemies of God. The fate of Balaam was similar to that of Judas, and their characters bear a marked resemblance to each other. Both these men tried to unite the service of God and mammon, and met with signal failure. Balaam acknowledged the true God, and professed to serve Him. Judas believed in Jesus as the Messiah and united with his followers. But Balaam hoped to make the service of Jehovah the stepping stone to the acquirement of riches and worldly honor, and failing in this, he stumbled and fell and was broken. Judas expected by his connection with Christ to secure wealth and promotion in that worldly kingdom which, as he believed, the Messiah was about to set up. The failure of his hopes drove him to apostasy and ruin. Both Balaam and Judas had received great light and enjoyed special privileges, but a single cherished sin poisoned the entire character and caused their destruction. It is a perilous thing to allow an unchristian trait to live in the heart. One cherished sin will, little by little, debase the character, bringing all its nobler powers into subjection to the evil desire. The removal of one safeguard from the conscience, the indulgence of one evil habit, one neglect of the high claims of duty, breaks down the defenses of the soul and opens the way for Satan to come in and lead us astray. 
the only safe course is to let our prayers go forth daily with a sincere heart, as did David. Hold up my goings in thy paths, that my footsteps slip not. Psalm 17, verse 5.